to be in Hebrews chapter 8. Somebody pointed out, one of my good friends, that I put that it was still last week's lesson. So my bad, I was wrong about that. It is chapter 8 out of Hebrews. Well, are you the type of person that uh, if your car's having problems and problems, do you keep fixing it up or do you buy a new one? I know, you buy a new one, okay? <laughs> not until I have to. Not until you absolutely have to. Buying cars is not fun, is it? Uh, well, no, it's, it's fun, but it, there's a reality to it that's not so fun. Anyway, uh, I'll leave that on there for just a minute. That's the QR code that's inside uh, the sheet here at the very top. So you guys have it. Well, when it comes to the Bible, we have the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Do we? I mean, they had to go through a lot of things. It was God's rule. They had to follow the pattern. But it had its problems. Like your car does sometimes. And the problem was not with the law. The whole the law was holy, just, and good. The problem was people. The problem was you and me. Uh, we couldn't keep it. And so God had to, and knew this, and he had a plan to send his son. In fact, a lot of the Old Covenant as, wow, what is it, Romans? What's Romans? Is it 12 2? That doesn't sound right. It says the things that were written the four time were written for our learning. Is that Romans 11, maybe? For our learning. But the Old Testament had, had a lot of good stuff. The problem was we couldn't keep it. Uh, wow. Wow. <clears throat> I must be getting old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm older than I was last week. <laughs> uh, the thing, maybe it's 12 4. I don't know. The things that were written the four times, I know that's King James, were written for our learning. And a lot of, I think we have to look through and, and live through and think through living through the old covenant. To come to appreciate the new covenant. And we get to understand things like uh, sacrifices and the importance of all of that. Anybody find it yet? I just figured Romans 15.4. Romans 15.4. Okay. There you go. I was kind of getting numbers right. Yeah. If I could turn that 2 to a 5, I had 15.4 or something. Uh, so by living through that, Experience is one of the best teachers, isn't it? Seeing people live through it is really helpful. I'm, I'm glad we don't have to uh, come to church in our pickup trucks and stock trailers and bring sheep to offer on, a, <laughs> on the sacrifice. Uh, but wow, they, they did that. God helped them learn to live through that. And so we're that way. And we have uh, doesn't this sound good? This, this is almost like EVs, electric vehicles. We have a new one that we don't have to fix all the time. Now, that's the promise that they, they want you to think about EVs. But, the, but we have a new covenant that is great. We have a great king, a great high priest. We have the perfect sacrifice, we don't have to do it over and over and over and all that. So we live under this new covenant. And that's what, what the Hebrew writer is preaching about or teaching about. And it, it uh, to me, this sounds like preaching whenever he says in verse 1 of chapter 8, now the main point of what we are saying is this. That sounds like a, almost like an audible, uh, audio teaching and learning. So it sounds like a sermon. And uh, he, he says this is really kind of the heart of it, one of the main points that we need to figure out. These are This is probably, uh, when we talk about those elementary doctrines, those, those core 
teachings. This is one of them, is that, that Jesus is our high priest and we are under a new covenant. Now, processing, understanding what it means to have a new covenant is uh, easier for those of us in the restoration movement who have studied it and thought through it. Uh, other people tend to want to uh, pick and choose out of the Bible. I'll take a little of that and a little of this over here and, and put it in and create kind of what they want to. And we don't want to go back to the old law. Not that we don't study it. We should learn from it. It is profitable for us to understand all of those things, Romans 15, 4. And uh, so it, it helps us in that process. But we have something far greater and he ends up saying it is becoming obsolete. Uh, Doug is going to read for us tonight. He's going to read chapter 8, verse 1 through 6. Now the main point in the things which are being said is this. We have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister of the holy things and of the true tent, which the Lord built, not man. As every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, so it was necessary that he have something which he might offer. However, if he were on the earth, he would not be a priest, since there are those who offer gifts according to the law. They, by example and shadow, serve the heavenly things, even as Moses, when... He was about to finish the tent, was divinely commanded, see, that, that you make everything according to the pattern which was shown to you in the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, because he is the mediator of a better covenant, which is based on better promises. All right, thank you very much. So what's the main point? What would you say the main point is? Eternal priest. We have an eternal priest. We have a high priest. We have a uh, a unique priest that's not going to die. Well, he is going to die, isn't he? I mean, uh, in a sense, I'm on the cross for us. That's past tense now. But he lives forever, make intercession for us. He he uh, he's the high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne. Place of authority. A place of authority, that's right. Uh, that That's almost terminology, unless you read the Bible, doesn't mean much to us anymore, does it? I mean, who's sitting down at your right hand right now? <laughs> Wiley, you're by yourself, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, the place of authority on the throne of the, the one in charge of the majesty in heaven, talking about God. And I like how he uses the word majesty. Yes, Jerry. We do remember who he's who he's writing to here. Back in this time, those coming out of Judaism, this is something really strange and really different. And and if you go back and look, at, he uses the argument of this Jesus being the new high priest. In the Bible, it's it's more than three chapters that he uses this argument. Which today we would say he's beating the bush to death. Yeah. But uh, these people had to realize that the priests that you have aren't the one that God wants now. Mm -hmm. Here's a new priesthood, and he's going to, he's using this to show that this is a better one, this is an everlasting one. And, uh, um, and, and as we'll read later on, it's because of, of a change in the law. Yeah. Are we sometimes spoiled that we've had all that we've ever known is the new covenant. All that we've ever really known is having this great high priest who is there for us. It is far superior to what, what the Old Testament people had. And I, I think sometimes we can easily take it for granted realizing and not realizing just how great and awesome and perfect and holy of a high priest we have. Yeah, and I think 
like in verse 5, these priests under the Levitical law served as a copy. I'm sure they didn't realize what that they were doing this as a copy for us. Uh huh. Because the high <coughs> priest then went into the Holy of Holies once a year. Right. Our high priest is in the holy place permanently. Yes, in heaven. And uh, that's, that's one of the, uh, I'm sure they didn't realize, hey, we're doing a copy of what's coming. I, mm -hmm. don't think, I don't think they had a clue about that. Yeah, think about that word copy, maybe. I, I immediately think of a copying machine. And if we go to a copying machine and we make a copy, do you want the original or the copy? You want the copy, but the original came first. In this case, the copy was there, and then now we have the original, which is far superior, so much better. Um, and Melchizedek was superior to the Levitical priest system, but here Jesus is, is even up another notch. He is, is perfect. Uh, and he serves... In the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by mere human beings. You know, that tabernacle in the Old Testament, they would go through the desert. I mean, they would move it. There was all kinds of procedures and things they had to do. But they constantly had to move. But as you pointed out, that true tabernacle uh, that was made by the Lord, uh, we are a part of in... He, uh, the high priest, is in heaven, the holy of holies, the true holy of holies. So, uh, I've got those questions up there, not that they're super important, but uh, you would think this would be the incentive for them not to turn away from Christianity. If they're really realizing what God is doing, if they see that picture, and it's the same way, I think, for us. Uh, real contrast there. I've got a little picture down at the bottom, and that is small print. You cannot read that. It's much bigger on a computer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but anyway, there's some, the old covenant and the new covenant are some real differences there, a real contrast. Uh, uh, yes? That verse 6 really has so much uh, depth. Yes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is superior. I'm trying to think what Hugo's translation said there. He may have said superior. More excellent. More excellent. I mean, it is. How do you get better than more excellent? I mean, it's it's top notch. It is. It's perfect. It's ideal uh, to theirs. As the covenant which he mediated is superior, our, our New Testament, our New Covenant, uh, and, and I think about that, sometimes we think of New Testament, We obviously there is Old Testament, New Testament books, but the overall covenant, the agreement, the uh, document, but it's more than a document, it's it's not it's not a contract. It's a covenant between us and God. That that big agreement is very superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. And then you start thinking about listing those promises. There there's a lot there, and that that's. I put that picture there. It's kind of the transition between that and the next section. Uh, that Old Testament, verse 5, Moses was warned as he, as he was about to build the tabernacle to do it, to make it. Everything according to the pattern shown, on, shown you on the mountain. So Moses had to do it the way God wanted it. And they did that. And every time they took down the tabernacle and moved and put it back up. They did it just the way God wanted to, or at least that was the goal of doing it. Now, aren't you glad that when you travel and you go to, uh, if you were going to the Super Bowl this weekend, aren't you glad you don't have to take the tabernacle with you and set it up and all of that? You can, you can look on your phone and find a, a church and go to church there and it's the people 
<coughs> and Jesus is there. And we get to worship. And we're part of a uh, part of an organism that functions throughout the world. And we continue to expand that. Questions or comments over that so far? Yes. When I think of all of that, Kevin, I think of, I mean, we read about the sacrifices and how many had to be sacrificed for whatever sin and the traveling, taking down the tabernacle and moving it. And the price, our, my mind can't fathom all of that. But the fact that Jesus, one man, mm -hmm. paid the price for all of our sins, yeah. no more sacrificing, no more moving that tabernacle, that one, one time. Mm -hmm. Shows just how superior, elite, Jesus is. And we are, I'm so thankful I was born in, under the Christian age, rather than the patriarchal age or the mosaic age, uh, we have a great thing. So we should, God has blessed us, and let's not be like spoiled Christians and neglected. I think, I mean, you would have thought in those early days, whenever they got to experience this new covenant, that they would have thought, this is so new and exciting, we'll never go back to it. But people do. Uh, we are creatures of habit and and all that. If I understand correctly, Kevin. I think our high priest is with us right now. Yes. Yeah. As as we understand, Christ is with us, and God's Spirit lives within each of us Christians. We have Christ dwelling in us, and uh, God the Father owns us. He's put His seal. Uh, mark on us, and God is with us. Lo, I will be with you always. Yeah. And for them, their system, God was with them, but their system was they had to go to kind of a structure. Uh, that's where they thought of God dwelling, and we are so privileged that God goes with us. Okay. Now, the Hebrew writer is going to, to uh, really center everything around Jeremiah 31, verse 31 through 34. This is the quote from that Old Testament book where Jeremiah told about and prophesied about the new covenant that was going to come. So it's a different system. It's a new covenant that is different. And so, Doug, if you will, read 7 through 13. <clears throat> if that first had been faultless, no place for a second would have been sought. But since he has found them at fault, he says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord, this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall not teach each one his neighbor, and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because all shall know me, from the least to the greatest of them. I will be merciful to their wrongdoings, and I will remember their sins no more. By saying new, he has made the first old. That which is old and aging is near destruction. All right. Uh, to me, that's a real simple passage, but there, there are some things to wrap our hand, uh, minds around and our hearts kind of connected to those. And let me just open up questions or comments or thoughts. What do we learn about God? And what do we learn about people, maybe, in this section? What, what are your thoughts from this passage? He has a plan. He does have a plan. 
Each one that makes things right. Where um, we can follow after him and be his people. And he's going to make things right where we can follow after him and be his people, be pleasing to him through a, a uh, start to say a system. Yeah, that's probably not a bad word. System. Uh, an organized way of going through it and and relating to, to God uh, through this new system. There's uh, verse 7 says, for if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant. And that's, again, the problem was not with the the covenants, so to speak, except for human beings couldn't keep it. Um, as much as they tried, they, they always fell short. Uh, no place would have been sought for another one. And I think God knew all knew this all the way along, even when he approached Abraham, you remember, he said, it's going to be through your seed, through your descendant, Jesus, that the plan of reaching everybody is going to be through Christ. And, and part of that new system is not about just a legal document of do's and don'ts. We're talking about a covenant and a relationship that deals with truth, uh, real truth, God being truth, Jesus being truth, relating through him as a person and what he taught us to be able to live for Jesus and, and uh, live that way. But it says, verse 8, but God found fault with the people. That's uh, the old the old joke kind of comes to mind, you know. Uh, I, I love kids in the abstract, not in the concrete, whenever they were messing in the concrete. Uh, I, I love the church as the people I can't stand. You know, that's a, that's a really uh, messed up thinking, not understanding what the church really is. I heard it once that the best thing about the Lord's church are the people, and the worst thing about the Lord's church are the people. Yeah. Uh, and that, that we all have to relate to other people, but God, God uh, makes the saved people the body of Christ. We are all imperfect, and we have to overlook sins and and odd things. To get along, yes. I think the Lord wanted to start over again because the people wouldn't have listened to him in the first covenant. And uh, he brought about a flood to end that one and start another one. And so now he's got this new covenant and depending on the people for obedience. That's the key. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're not a perfect people. We, uh, uh, outsiders tend to think that we are perfect or that we think we're perfect. And we're perfect in the eyes of Christ and God through the blood of Jesus. But but we all have our issues and our problems and our challenges and difficulties and and that's part of it. How, yes, Dale? That's, we're going to see in chapter kind of that the love of God is so great that this new covenant, it goes back and covers the sins that were committed under the old covenant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the blood of Christ is uh, covers people of all time because uh, he's the only perfect sacrifice. Uh, can we explain covenant better? Do you know how to, what, what is a covenant? Because we tend to think of them as contracts, legal documents. You know, press hard and sign the 15 copies below, although that's even old now, isn't it? You sign on a computer now with your finger and try to write and scribble something. That a close be. relationship with God. Okay, covenant is a close relationship with God. And his, and his will. Yeah, involving his will, his, his, uh, yeah, I like will, his, his, his thinking, we relate to him. I think we need to remember that it's a one-way covenant, too. I don't have any input into what the covenant's going to be. Yeah. Mankind did not have any input into what it's going to be. 
uh, God says, this is this is what it is. And, uh, you mean we can't change it? Uh, not, uh, <laughs> don't you dare. Yeah. Covenant sort of the guideline that, you know, if you go in to buy a house, you sign the covenants of your, of your association, which are the guidelines you have to follow, the rules right. that you have to follow as you live in the world, in the, the location. Yeah. Uh, and for us, the new covenant is how we relate to one another as well as relate to God. That's, that's uh, a good point. Under the old covenant, uh, and this is what Jeremiah is trying to make the point, I think, is under the old covenant, you were born you were male, you were circumcised the eighth day, you were uh, raised to be brought up, and you went through different processes and times. And then, as you got old enough to understand and be taught, you were taught to know the Lord. Think about that a little bit. It was almost like, to a large extent, you didn't have a choice. <laughs> was, your parents made that choice for you. And the New Covenant... The day you become a Christian, you know the Lord because you've been operating and learning and getting to understand Him. And as adults, I say adults, it's an adult decision to follow Jesus, to be baptized, to follow Him. You know Him from day one. In fact, if you don't know the Lord when you're baptized, I would encourage you to think about <laughs> rebaptism or being baptized, being immersed in the name of the Lord. Uh, and think about that a little bit. So we we should know better. We should know the Lord and and live it out from there. There's kind of an odd statement. Otherwise, uh, verse 11 on the back it says, uh, "No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me." Not everybody's going to know the Lord in our lifetime. Although when He comes back. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus as Lord. It's going to be undeniable. But as we in the church, as, as we think about our neighbors uh, in church, part of the covenant, covenant people, we know the Lord. We don't have to tell people, oh, you need to get to know the Lord. Now, we may have guests that come in here and need to get to know the Lord. But we should know the Lord and know how to follow him. And to live for him. Uh, God took them by the hand in the old covenant, verse 9, and led them out of Egypt. Uh, but they didn't remain faithful to that covenant. God talked to them and uh, dealt with them. And, and they just didn't, didn't uh, they turned away from him. And this is the covenant that I will establish with the people of Israel. After that time, the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds. And write them on their hearts. Um, that's how you transform lives. It's from the inside out. You, you can't force people from the outside to behave right. You change their hearts. And that's the reason why Jesus changed their hearts. And I'll be their God. They'll be my people. That's part of that covenant. Uh, and then verse 12. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more by calling this covenant new. He has made that first one, that original one, that Old Testament one, that law of Moses is obsolete. And what's obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. And it will lose its uh, influence. That little phrase makes me think if this was written before AD 70 for the destruction of Jerusalem, that idea of soon disappearing, that old covenant system is going to come crashing down and, and disappear. Questions or comments? This could also refer to just how much of the gospel is spread around the world. Uh, you know, Jews live outside of Palestine uh, would be later in hearing the gospel. So, uh, it, it took time to initially spread the gospel, so uh, that's why I think he says this is vanishing away. It, it's slowly going away. And it's interesting that even today, 
there are people who want to incorporate the Old Testament into the church. Mm -hmm. And there are some things we can learn from it, but we don't get stuck. <laughs> but it's not part of the covenant. It's not part of the new covenant. Yeah. Very good. Even though some of the ideas in it are in the new covenant. Yeah, repeat it again in the new covenant. Dale? Yeah. That covenant that we have been blessed with brought out in Revelation 2, where he says, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. That, that's an agreement. We agree. We will be faithful. He'll give us a crown of life. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. You mentioned out of Revelation 2, uh, being faithful. He'll give us a crown of life. Andy, are you ready?